And so once you start to recognize the tactics that people will use to silence you, you can stand up for yourself better. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up feeling like I was pushed around a lot, disrespected, walked over, taken advantage of, whether it was by friends, boyfriends, families, teachers, or even bosses. And often, many of us stay quiet, whether it's because we're people pleasers and don't want to ruffle anyone's feathers, or we don't actually have the confidence to be honest in case of backlash, or we don't even think we have a choice. So what happens is we stay in silent desperation. Or maybe you become passive aggressive, or maybe you just become aggressive because really that's the only way to be heard. But guys, the truth is, no matter what is holding you back, speaking up, having the confidence to lay out what your lines are, what your non-negotiables are, what your boundaries are, is the most important thing you can actually do for a relationship, any relationship. And so lucky for us, today's Women of Impact, a licensed therapist and sought after relationship expert for over 13 years, is here to show us how speaking up and saying what you need is not creating conflict in the relationship, but rather giving it the exact medicine it needs to be healthy. So guys, please help me in welcoming the woman featured everywhere from the New York Times, Essence, Forbes, Psychology Today and Vice, as well as author of the upcoming book, Set Boundaries, Find Peace. The boundary builder herself, the empowering Nedra Glover Tawab. Wow. I want you to do my intro everywhere. Oh my God, what your work and what you practice is exactly what I wish I had when I was younger. So where I really want to start though, is when you say like the key, the two pillars of a successful relationship, a healthy relationship, whether it's with a partner, whether it's with a friend, a sibling, a parent is boundaries and communication. And so where I'd love to start is talk to me about how we even acknowledge where we need those boundaries in the first place. Because I actually have a quote from you, which I just, I literally laughed out loud. We may not even know what we need, but we know what we don't like. And I was like, oh, that's so powerful. Take me a little deeper into that and how we can use that um, as our first stepping stone to acknowledging where we need a boundary. When we find ourselves ruminating, talking about those things that are troubling and problematic, that is an indicator that we are having an issue with something. Oftentimes, we'll just ignore it like, oh, this person gets on my nerves. But why? Why do they get on your nerves? What's going on in this relationship that's causing you to have this response when you talk to this person, when you see a text message from this person, when you interact with them, could it be that there is a boundary that could be set that would repair, enhance, or save the relationships? Lots of times it's a yes. And instead of advocating for what we need, what we want, or what we want less of, um, we kind of deal with it. And it's very frustrating to be in a situation where you don't feel like this person gets it or they're doing this thing that you really don't like. I think the number one way to know when you need a boundary is your feelings. Mm. How do you feel when something happens? When you say yes, do you later feel like I'm always saying yes to them? Or do you feel resentful? Do you feel taken advantage of? Do you feel angry, upset, sad, those are indicators that perhaps there is a boundary that is needed for you to um, feel really good in those relationships with people. That's fantastic. So what happens then if somebody comes to you and you start feeling these emotions, right? And you're like, Nedra told me, okay, this is where I need to set a boundary because I'm really feeling it. And you go to set a boundary and the person opposite either says, you're being too sensitive or, you know, um, they almost put it on you. Like this is a you problem. How do you, how would you deal with that? Because I think that that's where it shuts a lot of people down, where they start to feel badly about themselves. It starts to become, you know, detrimental to their self-esteem. They don't want to have that conflict with that person. Um, and so you end up staying quiet. How do you progress? We have to learn how to recognize when we're being manipulated, 
when we're being taken advantage of. Lots of times people will use those tactics as a way to shut you up, right? Because they want to do something that you don't want them to do. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying this stuff as a way to say to you, be quiet. Here's my bound. They're giving you their boundary. Don't talk to me about this stuff. And so once you start to recognize the tactics that people will use to silence you, you can stand up for yourself better. I was just talking to a friend about a situation I had where someone was doing something really mean and they would gaslight me and they would say, well, I did it because you did this thing. And, you know, at the time I was really young and, and I never thought it was my fault. I would think, huh, there's really something wrong with this person. So <laughs> like this thing is clearly not my fault. Um, at that time, I was in a, in a position to get out of it, right? But as I've gotten older, I am very clear on when I'm being manipulated, when I'm being taken advantage of. I'm clear of the wording, you know, that people will use, like you're being too sensitive, you're taking this too far, you're in your feelings. It's not that big of a deal. When I hear those things, I think it is that big of a deal. I'm talking about it. Anything I talk about is a big deal. Um, so I feel something and you're being dismissive. So the more you increase your language around what's happening in the situation, the better you will be at recognizing when someone is trying to set boundaries over your boundaries. They're really trying to say, hey, I don't want you to talk to me about this thing. And this is how I'm going to get you to stop. Mm. What do you mean increase your language? Can you give me an example? Developing your vocabulary. Mm. So knowing what it sounds like when someone is taking advantage of you by using certain phrases. Um, I would do it for you if you ask me or um, mm. it seems like you have enough time to do it. Why don't you, you can't do it on Saturday, you know, when they're trying to, do these things that you're like, wow, like I feel really bad again for not doing it. And although we don't like to take certain things as a complete statement, like, no, um, that doesn't work for me. This is not a good time. We'd really like to challenge that with people. It's not okay. Mm. It's not okay for us to do it to people. And it's not okay for that to be done to us. So true. So now I want to ask what happens then if, both of your boundaries now come into conflict. And I want to give a great example. I heard you say in an interview that you have a boundary where it's the last person to get out of bed has to make it. And I love that so much. And I was like, the, it was the perfect example because my husband and I used to argue about bloody making the bed. And I grew up making the bed. That was the first thing you did. And he grew up in a world where his parents didn't care if he made the bed or not. So for him, it actually is against his value system because he thinks of it as a waste of time. So now I think of it as this is my sanctuary. This is my peace. This is my place of, you know, calm. And his boundary is valuable but it's completely against mine so a take me through did you find that with your uh, partner um and then b what would you do in situations like that where both boundaries are valid mm -hmm. yeah it does sound like both boundaries are valid but i would ask especially in a marriage um do you want to be right or do you want to have a happy relationship? Right. And there are some things where, yeah, maybe I don't like to make the bed, but if this is pleasing to my partner, can I do it as a show of I love you? Perhaps my love language is you making the bed. That is an act of service to me. Mm. Um, so I need you to make the bed. So perhaps positioning it in a different way, because sometimes people don't like the word boundary, right? So positioning it in a different way, like I really feel cared for when you make the bed because this is my sanctuary and my place of peace. And so it's really important to me to get into the bed and it's all nice and every, all, the, all the 100 pillows are there and then we knock them on the floor. Um, it just feels like a peaceful experience. And it would be really be helpful if you supported me in doing this thing, you know, a few times a week or daily, whatever 
sort of rotation you want to do. But sometimes it's not about we're both right. Whose side do we choose? But we 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 love each other. And this is not a boundary that's like life changing. Right. This isn't a boundary that would end a relationship, but it's certainly an irritant. Right. Yes. So do you do you want to get along or do you really want to stand on principle here? Yeah, God. So where is the line between you actually need to stay firm on this? And if someone doesn't reciprocate, then it's a sign of disrespect versus, you know what? OK, you've set the boundary, but you've heard the other person out and now you start to negotiate your boundary. Where is that fine line? Yeah, so here's a, and I talk about it's a whole chapter on, on this boundaries with yourself, because we can only ask people for so much, right? And once they repeatedly show that they will not honor the boundary, that's where you have to say, this is my boundary with this person around this thing. So if it is making the bed, you know, maybe my boundary is, you know, I will make my side if you want to do that. <laughs> or, you know, I will make the bed yeah. or, you know, hey, I will make the bed, but I need assistance in this other area. Like there needs to be some other things that that you can do. You can't make a person respect your boundary. You can only make a request. So you can say this is what I need. I would really like. But you can't change another person's behavior and the best boundaries are the boundaries that we set with ourselves with other people because it's very hard to get people to do what you want them to do in all instances if you say you know hey we're going to a party don't get too drunk you can't make that person not have seven drinks you can say hey after after i see you have two drinks i'm leaving (laughs) <laughs> you can't make them manage their alcohol intake. It is their alcohol intake. You can have boundaries around how much you will assist them when they get drunk, um, how much you're willing to watch it, how much you're willing to, like you can have a lot of boundaries in a situation that you can't control. God, I love that so much because that was part of one of the questions that I had is that a lot of people think that it's certain things aren't optional, right? Like, well, I can't say that to them. Well, I can't not do this. Well, it's my mom. I can't not speak to her. Um, and the truth is everything is a choice. And I've heard you say that of you are choosing to engage in that relationship. Um, how do we start to take ownership over that to empower ourselves? Um, going to the chapter that you just said about boundaries with ourselves, how do we actually do that? So one of the biggest challenges is our programming. We are taught to almost not have boundaries, right? It's Mm -hmm. like, um, you know, I see it all the time with, with kids. I have, I have two and when my daughter, my oldest daughter was really young, there was someone who said to her, hey, give me a hug. And and I haven't seen you in a while. And she was like two or three. And she was like, I don't want to. (laughs) She's like, I don't want to. And the person kept trying. I was like, well, you know, she doesn't have to. And I kind of picked her up and moved her away. But I've, I've seen that play out where people are like, no, give that person a hug. You know, do this thing that someone is requesting. Um, you don't know when you're full, keep eating, eat everything on your plate. So there are things that adults may do, you know, smile, be happy. You have to wear, you know, like all of these things that really take us away from the ability to be assertive. I think we do have boundaries, but they've gone um, unheard for so long that we start to think they're no longer important. And so it's not that, oh my gosh, I don't have any boundaries. We typically do. It's about how do, how do we express those things that are inside? We don't express them because oftentimes we've been programmed not to have any boundaries. It's not okay. It's me. You can't tell people that you don't want to come to their party. You know, you have to like everyone. And, yeah. You know, that your aunt is going to be really mad if you don't call her on her birthday. Like all of these things that are done to make you feel like, You must say yes. You must do this thing, even if you don't want to. But there is a way to say no or um, I won't be able to do that in a gentle way. 
I think it becomes aggressive when we are yelling, we are pushing people, we're using, you know, old situations and examples and, you know, we're name calling, we're starting an argument. That's when it becomes aggressive. And that typically happens when we feel like we've just been taken advantage of for so long that we just get to this point where it's like, ah, why are you always asking me to do stuff? And, you know, it comes out as this yelling fest instead of saying no. And no should be used consistently, right? And when people keep asking you things, how do we have the conversation around I see that you're not understanding that it's a no for me. And so what I would like is for you to stop asking me about this thing. Mm. Yeah. What happens then when people still keep asking? Um, Does that come to sometimes you just have to cut people out of your life? Is that sometimes you just have to accept them how they are and they're going to continuously cross those boundaries and you have to deal with it and suck it up and be okay with it like what's the because I think of different scenarios right it's like there are certain people parents are harder siblings are harder to push back on um love you know partnerships husbands boyfriends you know wives whatever um that seems a lot harder and so I think a lot of people go to just then shutting down versus actually still working through it still pushing through it um, Mm -hmm. to find a conclusion because if you're in a let's say a marriage or a relationship where they have the boundary and they just keep pushing back if you accept it I can't see a world where that relationship lasts or am I just Mm -hmm. being naive you know you presented a few options can you just suck it up can you, you know, re- reestablish the boundary? Do you just say that's how that person is? Do you cut them off? Any of those can be true. And it's all based on your comfort level. Some people just won't cut people off that are unhealthy for them. And I don't want you to. I don't want you to do anything that is going to uh, be uncomfortable and difficult and maybe harm your life in doing. Even, you know, like sometimes people just don't feel like they can do that. Hmm. And that's not anything that I would put. You have to, you you don't have to. I mean, it might be healthy for you, but you don't have to do it until you're ready to do it. Because my readiness may be different from your readiness. I may choose not to be in a certain type of relationship with a person, but your tolerance of nonsense may be higher than mine. I can't determine that. I can't determine that. I think the challenge is having a one set rule about cutting people off. I do think we have to do what is best for us and what feels the most comfortable. There are situations where it may not be to your advantage to to have a relationship with a parent. But if you can't envision not having a relationship with a parent, I don't know if it's healthy for me to tell you, you got to cut them off. This is your life and you get to choose. All of this is a choice. That's why I say all of those things could be true because they are all choices. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out which choice you can live with. I will say that when I hear the word, how do I deal with blank? I often think about dealing with anything is a choice. So if you ever struggle with how do I deal with my mother? You don't have to. Dealing with anything is a choice. So you can choose not to, or you can con- you can choose to continue dealing with it. Um, and some things are just intolerable. And so cutting people off could be helpful. Also placing boundaries on ourselves. Again, you know, there are some people who may chronically complain about the same thing and you are emotionally drained by experiencing this. Guess what? You don't have to talk to that person every day. You don't have to talk to that person for two hours when you do talk to them. You can determine what works best for your energy. You can say, you know, I do like talking to this person. I do want this person in my life. You know, maybe I'll talk to them once a month for five minutes. Maybe that works. That could be your own boundary with this person. So you figure out what works for you instead of looking at what everybody, you know, what everybody says, like cut them off, do this. You may not be able to do that in some situations, but you might be able to put some boundaries around how you interact with the person. 
Girl, that's so strong. And like, I just want to put you on loop and repeat saying it's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. And putting like a beat to it because it's (laughs) like, it's so strong. And that's, I think it seems so simple. But when I say that was what held me back for so long, because I didn't think I had a choice. I was born taught a certain belief system about certain things. You don't cut your family out. You don't tell, you know, your dad that you um, can't have this conversation. It's like, as a good Greek girl, you sit down and you are quiet, you know? And so it's so empowering to tell people you have a choice, whether it's a partner or a friend or, you know, a boss, like you do have a choice and that choice is yours. You may not like the outcome. You may not like the backlash that comes from it, but to allow people to really believe it, that it's a choice, I think is, um, is so fundamental to everything that we're talking about here. Because if you don't think you have a choice, then you're not going to even start to make the change in the first place to have the re- the healthy relationship that you were saying people can have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the piece about having a choice is so important because we often feel disempowered, like these systems that we, we grew up in these systems and cultures that are part of our lives absolutely dictate how we view things, whether that view is healthy or not. And we have to unlearn those things that are no longer useful to us. And we have to relearn concepts that are useful. And that's that's very challenging. And when you're in a cultural system, it, it is hard to be the, the one person who is saying, you know, I'm not going to do this thing because it doesn't feel good to me or you know, I would like to live my life in this way. It, it, it is really hard to do that because there's not going to be a lot of support within that group. And so what we have to begin to do is maybe find new people who are supportive of the lifestyle philosophy that we're trying to create. That's what I was going to ask you. How do people start creating that lifestyle? So things like following you on Instagram, let's just say it's freaking amazing. Um, they need to follow you. But what other things can people do? So they're listening to this interview. They're like, oh my God, yes, I need to make this change. I really do need to let go of my, you know, maybe past beliefs or just the way I used to think. And I really want to cultivate this new way of thinking. What steps can they take in order to do that? So you said finding people. I think community is everything. And I freaking love that. And you know that that phrase, um, the five people you surround yourself with is how you think and, you know, uh, turn up every day. So what are the other things that maybe people can do to start cultivating that? Mm -hmm. Getting to know themselves better. When we tap into who we really are, it really shows us why we accept things and how we have allowed things to go on for so long. So getting to know yourself more. Journaling is a wonderful way to start to know more about yourself. Learning your triggers and coming up with ways to respond to those things. So when you are triggered by this person who um, violates a boundary or by a situation that Um, you may see on TV. What do you do? How do you ground yourself in these moments of maybe not having support from other people or being taken aback by something that you see or some experience you have? How do you ground yourself? Um, And I just want to go back to community. I think being vulnerable with people is a real way to build that community because so often on Instagram, in the comment section, I see so many people experiencing the same thing. And they say, you know, they may send me a message and say, I thought I was the only one. Yet there are thousands. There are thousands because we're not talking enough. We're not sharing our experiences enough. So we feel like I'm the only person with with this, you know, very random situation. And it's like, no, it's like all of us, all of us have the same situation and we just don't talk about it. So you can't even find community if you're not being honest about your story. Mm -hmm. If you're not being honest about what's going on, who you are, your, your, your background, that's how you find your people. You draw your people to you by being vulnerable and that authenticity. People are like, oh my gosh, that's, that's my same thing. And it's like, yeah, look, we have the same thing. And that's how you build connection with people. And that's when you start to see 
wow, okay, so you did it like that. Maybe I'll try it like that. And so you start to get some information about some of these things you're going through. And, you know, I, there's so many spaces, you know, maybe online when the world was open, you know, there's groups and, and all sorts of things for us to be in community. And those are good things because we do need to be with people who experience things like us, who did not, who, you know, we need a variety of people in our lives. And so community is really, really important. I love that. Um, and you were actually saying something you were saying about, um, in like the language you use with people and how you, you know, show up. And I pulled one of your posts that I really want to go deep into because this is something that I personally struggle with, which I notice a lot of people do, where they're not necessarily being clear about what that boundary is or about how someone else's boundary is affecting them. And this goes to the second part of communication. And so I pulled a couple of things that you put, sometimes the problem is, and I loved this post so much, and I'd love to go through a few of them, where you put, sometimes the problem is you allow them to vent without telling them you aren't prepared to listen. I was like, oh my God, that's so strong. So that goes back to, that's actually a you problem, right? It's you mm-hmm. haven't told them that you're not prepared to listen. How on earth do you do that? Um, I can't talk right now. I'm on my way to work. I'm about to start my day. Oh. This is not a good time for me. Um, is this something we can talk about later? Wow, I thought I was just answering the phone and it was going to be very light, but this sounds like something that has a lot of detail and I actually was about to hop on a call. Um, I think there are many ways to say, I can't talk about this thing. It sounds really big and this is not the best time for me to get into it. Because there are some people who will call and they're just like, this is the problem. And they just go. (laughs) And you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm in line getting a sub. (laughs) I'm not not prepared for this. (laughs) And it has to be okay for us to have some limits around when we're able to talk about certain topics. And I think people can understand that. We assume they can't, that whatever they want to talk about, we're their only person in the whole wide world. And if we don't talk about it while we're standing in line, they won't have anyone. And that's typically not true. Because if I have a real problem, I have a few people, you know, maybe not a ton, but I have, I'm like, okay, she didn't answer. All right. She didn't answer. Okay. Got one. You know, like, I found somebody. <laughs> got one now. Girl, you got a minute? All right. Here. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to ask people if they have the capacity, because sometimes people don't. I want to know if you're, you know in a store and you can't talk about something with me. So let me know. And lots of times when I ask that question, I've had people say, well, let me give you a call back in 10 minutes when I get back to my car, or let me give you a call back um, this evening when I'm not, you know, doing stuff with the kids. So they let me know when their energy will be available for me to really get into this issue because if it was a crisis, I think I would have called the police. So this is not, it's a life crisis, but it's not a crisis, Mm -hmm. right? And so this is something I probably could either find someone else, maybe go journal about, schedule a, a therapy session and wait for that person to give me a call back so I can process that with them. Yeah, I love that. But I also heard you in an interview, which is exactly how I felt. So this is why I wanted to bring up because you just said a lot of people interpret setting boundaries as being mean. And so when I read that post, where it's like you allow others to vent without you saying, hey, right now I'm not prepared to listen. My fear is that people are like, yeah, but I need you now. Are you just, are you not going to be here for me? Um, and so the fear of not being liked, the fear of not feeling like I'm, in fact, it's not even that, the fear of not feeling like I'm there for my friend. Mm -hmm. is also so um, just overwhelming that even if I can't handle the emotion that's coming at me in that moment, I do just suck it up. And I don't know if that's actually a good thing to do. Um, How do we overcome that thought of being a people pleaser, always trying to be perfect, always trying to be there for your friends or your partner or your parents when it ends up possibly being detrimental to you? Um, Mm -hmm. Because I'm really torn with that because I love my family and my friends and my partner more than, you know, life itself. So I get torn between those things. Yeah. 
you know, I, at the end of the day, we will always have ourselves. And then on top of that is everyone else. So the person that I have to please the most is me. It doesn't mean that what I need or what I want is more important than anyone else. But I certainly believe in self-care first because I cannot care for anyone or anything before I care for myself. And so with that in mind, um, as I am taking on, you know, more things, I have to think about, is this something that I really have the capacity to do? As I am listening more to people, I have to think, is my energy in a space to take this in? As, as I am offering more support, I have to think, can I really do this? Because we're not doing um, anyone a favor when we are depleted and still helping them. So often if I say no, it's in light of everything else that I have going on, things that I need to do for uh, my family that lives in my house, myself, and then I'm honoring outside requests. And people don't know what my calendar looks like, what my energy looks like, how, many, how much sleep I've had, how much water. They, they don't know these things. So as they're coming to me um, for help and, and, and with requests, uh, they don't have a background story. And so we don't have to take it personal, right? And say like, oh my gosh, this person should know that I can't. Well, they don't know because they don't know everything that's going on with you. And it's really our job to let them know that um, I really can't handle this thing right now in light of the other things that I have going on. Um, and there's no apology needed for that mm. because we don't have to apologize for, for having other things going on. There may be times when you're available to them and there may be times when you are not. This is, you know, this might be a not time. How do you avoid then apologizing? Because you're 100% right. It's like we do that a lot, right? We apologize for things because we want to be liked. Going back to people pleasing. How do you avoid that? Bite your tongue. <laughs> bite, your tongue and, bite your tongue until you get good at when you find yourself like, I, uh, 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 yeah. <clears throat> just cough. Don't finish it. Don't finish the sentence because... There is nothing to apologize for. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to apologize for. People tell us, you know, I'm so shocked sometimes at how hard it is for us to set boundaries. And then I think about all of the boundaries that people set with me. Everybody has these boundaries, you know, and we're constantly respecting other people's boundaries. Our parents, you know, who were super afraid to set boundaries with, they've had so many boundaries. You know, I'm, I'm happy that it's my turn. I'm like, remember that curfew? Ha ha, I got a boundary for you, mom. You know, it's like we, we've we had so many boundaries put on us by other people. It is okay for us to have a few. Girl, that hit me so hard. Like, that's so true. I mean, it's it's so simple, but it really did. Like, the fact that we all live in boundaries. But then yet we're talking about how do we set boundaries? It's almost like the boundaries we are used to. Um, one of my favorite quotes is the David Foster Wallace quote, where it's, I don't know if you've heard it, but there's a big fish swimming along and there's two little fish swimming by. And the big fish says to the little fish, what's up boys, how's the water? Little fish keeps swimming. One of the fish turns around and was like, what the hell is water? David Foster Wallace. The point being, when you're surrounded by something every day, you don't even question it to the point where you don't even realize it's true. And I liken that to the belief system, where the belief system that we have growing up, we don't realize is handed to us, is told to us by our teachers, our parents, the environment, the world, you know, the street we grew up in, all these things. And so it just, it, it never dawned on me that that's boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was so strong. Yeah, they're all around us. And here we are. We don't want to set our own personal yes. boundaries. And everyone we know has these personal boundaries. I mean, I, I grew up um, and I had a grandmother and there was, you know, certain furniture in her house she couldn't touch. You, this is the couch you do not sit on. Um, this is, you know, this is the table you do not touch. These place settings are not here for you to play, little girl. You know, it's like. This is just for decoration. Don't you touch that. You go in the kitchen at the table, that's where you eat. You know, so 
it was it was all of these things and i was just like okay yes grandma you know i wasn't like she has rules for me it was like no she has rules for me and what I love is I actually heard you even say it in an interview, like, and I never even asked my grandmother why she had the plastic on her sofa. It was just no. like, you don't ask, that's the boundary and you just respect it. Yeah, you just go with it. It's like, okay, I don't know. I mean, once I became an adult and I have kids, I'm like, I see what <laughs> Plastic see everywhere. <laughs> plastic everywhere. And now I'm like, don't sit there, don't sit there. This is where you eat. This is where I got all kind of boundaries now. But um, and my and my kids have boundaries too. You know, they they want to dress a certain way. They want to listen to you know certain songs that are you know not my taste. But hey, if you want to listen to that, you know it's it's appropriate. I don't like it, but go ahead. You know, so we we all have these things about us, and I think the more they're respected, the more we feel connected. Mm -hmm. I never questioned mm -hmm. my grandmother's boundaries because I knew she loved me. And if she had a rule, who cared? You know, like, I, I don't even care because this woman is about to feed me some good food and kiss on me. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't care about play. I won't sit there. You know, I didn't, even, I didn't even think to question it because I knew she loved me and we were so deeply connected that I didn't even think about these things. You know, it's like, I want to be in a relationship with you. And if being in this relationship with you means that I have to take my shoes off or I need to call you before nine o'clock or, you know, uh, you want a heads up if I want to talk about something deep. Okay, because I love you so much. It doesn't even matter to me. God, I love that so much. You just really hit the nail on the head of what this whole thing is about, is that literally by setting boundaries is actually creating a better relationship, a more connected relationship with that person. And so if we can shift our perspective instead of being like, I'm fearful of setting a boundary, am I going to cause conflict? I don't necessarily have the confidence. If we can just repeat to ourselves, it's actually going to bring us close. It's actually going to make us tighter. Like, I actually think that that's a great strategy of removing the fear that people may have of setting the boundary in the first place but the one thing that I do wonder though is sometimes when you set boundaries and you have people around you that respect them right you've communicated the boundary um you think that you're they're on board everyone understands and over time it starts to wean a bit and it's almost like your boundary has an expiration date um how do you deal with those things because those actually to me feel exhausting it's because you feel like, am I just like beating a dead horse? Does, is this a show of disrespect because I've told them in the past? Um, mm. How do you, how would you advise to deal with boundaries that may feel like um, they they have an expiration date? So one thing you could do is certainly restate the boundary. And when you get to the point of, wow, um, I've said this like seven times, um, maybe you want to say something a little more definite. And, you know, sometimes people keep asking because they really want to to um, break through the boundary and get you to eventually say yes or even forget about it. So it's like, OK, it's been two months. I've been doing this thing. Now I'll quit. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not really anything personal to you. That's just how we do things. We exercise for 10 days straight. Then we quit. Right. It's, it's not anything personal to Lisa. It's just something that people do um, because really sticking to it takes discipline. And it's not their thing. It's your thing. They're not doing their thing. And so it's it's hard being disciplined with our own stuff. Right. With the things that we actually want to do. I want to wake up at 5 a.m. I want to read two books a week. I want all of this stuff. That is hard to be disciplined add on to it somebody else's stuff like now they want you to do x y it's like i forgot like i don't I, mm. I did it five times i forgot this one time um as we're introducing our boundaries to people cut them some slack for being beginners at understanding this unless you think that they are maliciously trying not to listen to your boundary but sometimes people truly they forget um, is not at the top of mind because it's not their thing. We all struggle with discipline. Like there are lots of reasons that people aren't going to consistently be on top of your boundary. And it takes some level of training people to get them to really consistently get it. 
Gosh, I love that so much because I it was the initial feeling is always it's personal, right? It's against me. It's they don't respect me. Um, so talk to me then about um, codependency on setting boundaries and how that really does affect a relationship or really how like boundaries are the healthy thing to avoid codependency. Yeah, so in code- codependent relationships, there typically aren't any boundaries mm-hmm. um, because the relationship is dependent on the enmeshment, the rescuing, the saving, um, mm-hmm. the minimizing of really big problems. And so when you're engaged in those behaviors, there's typically not a lot of room for structure and limitations and expectations. And so having boundaries certainly breaks up the ability for a person to be codependent. Mm. And particularly when we have a family history of trauma and dysfunction, codependency, it's really hard to begin to set those boundaries because it's a new concept. They're Mm. like, whoa, wait a minute. You're the only person who's saying we have to do X. (laughs) <laughs> because the, the, the family uh, dynamic has operated on not having any boundaries, not having any rules or expectations, holding people accountable. And so in those instances, I have found it the hardest with people who have those dysfunctional backgrounds um, with family because it's not a supported concept. And so often, like we started, Um, with you saying that people are gaslighting you and making you feel like, why are you saying this to me? That is often the case because no one supports um, this concept of boundaries. But here's the thing. Mm. If it feels good, if it is a healthy concept, um, I don't know if it has to be supported with people that you're trying to um, implement it with. Mm. Because there are times where people just they won't support something healthy. And that doesn't mean that you're doing a bad thing. You know, if you're saying, hey, wash your hands when you come over my house, it doesn't mean that hand washing is bad if these people don't support it. It just means they won't support it. Continue your rule of hand washing. (laughs) So you don't have to take away these things because people are pushing back against them. You just have to build your strength and courage and consistently say, this is the thing I need you to do. And they may push back. And over time, they may, you know, well, let me wash my hands. I know you're going to say something about me washing my hands. Great. Excellent. I love it when you know I'm going to say something and you just do it. Wonderful. (laughs) That's so bad because you know that they're saying that to be kind of like jabby, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god I love that so much um girl I'm so excited about your book set boundaries and find peace and what is one big key thing I mean you've spoken about so much in this discussion so it's just so freaking amazing but what's like one key thing for people who are listening or watching right now that you feel like they can start immediately and they can take away from your book Immediately is understanding that we live in a world with boundaries and it is your right to have them too. I hope that is the immediate takeaway. As you're reading the book, I hope you connect with the stories in the book around how our history, how our narratives, our interactions with other people really impact our ability to have boundaries. But even with all of that history that we have, we can still set them. Setting them is not easy. That's why it's a whole book on how to do it, right? <laughs> right. I, don't, I don't want you to think like, oh, it's easier said than done. No, it's hard. <laughs> I'm not saying it's easier said than done, but it is possible. It is absolutely possible. And I assure you, You already have some boundaries. Mm -hmm. It may just be some small ones that you don't even consider boundaries, but you already have some and people are respecting them. How do you increase the boundaries that you already have? How do you develop new boundaries? How do you take those relationships that are really 
um, trouble and put boundaries into those. But we already have some boundaries. So we just need to learn how to execute boundaries in these situations where we feel disempowered. And from the book, I hope that people learn how to exercise their choices and speak about boundaries. I love that. And where can people find you and the book? Well, I am most active on Instagram and the book is available everywhere that books are sold. Um, It comes out March 16th. I'm so excited for the book. I think it will be everything that we need to know in one place about boundaries because it's such an interesting concept that we needed an entire book to talk about this really big thing. Yes, yeah, I'm so excited to read it myself. And thank you so much for coming on. Guys, 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 go check out her Instagram page. Go check out her website. She's got so much gold there. And then if you did like this episode, guys, please, please do subscribe, share, comment. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out, guys. What up guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like another dose of bad or arsery, make sure you watch this video right here or this one right here, because I know you'll like them. But hey, also, while you're here guys, you might as well click that subscribe button down there so you don't miss any future episodes. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out.